Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. Transistors are everywhere. In fact, the device that you're viewing this video on has trillions of transistors in it. Now, there are all kinds and types of transistors out there. But the first transistor was developed in Bell Labs in 1947. This was the Bipolar Junction Transistor, or BJT. Now, while other types of transistors have been developed since, BJTs are still, well, everywhere. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the Bipolar Junction Transistor to give you some insight on how they work. Now, I'm not going to go into the engineering level technical descriptions like I had to deal with in engineering oh. school. The object of this video is to give you an appreciation for what goes on under the hood so that the videos that follow in this series will make sense to you. Now, I'm making an assumption here. I'm assuming that you appreciate what happens in the PN junction of a diode because this is primary to understanding the bipolar junction transistor. If you're not, I strongly recommend that you take in the previous video in this series where I explain all of this. The link is up in the corner for you. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So, to begin with, I'll start with their basic structure. A BJT uses the same types of materials, just arranged a bit differently. It has three separately doped regions and two PN junctions. Shown here on the screen is what is referred to as an NPN transistor. You can see that we have some P-type material sandwiched between two N-type materials. The same action that I described, the PN junction of the diode, also applies to each of the two PN junctions that you see here. The center P-type material is referred to as the base of the transistor. This region is lightly doped. One of the N-type materials is referred to as the collector. This region is moderately doped. The remaining n-type material is the emitter. This region is heavily doped. The actual physical width of the base material is generally very, very narrow as compared to the emitter and the collector. Now, as you might have already noticed, the doping of the material used for the emitter and the doping of the material used for the collector is different. Thus, the emitter and the collector are not interchangeable. Now, so far, I've only talked about the NPN transistor, but it has a cousin, the PNP transistor. And as you might guess from its name, this has some N-type material sandwiched between two P-type materials. The principles all operate the same, but it's kind of upside down in how we use them. Because the emitter and the collector are both P-type material, the majority current carriers are holes as opposed to electrons. Okay, yeah, the actual current carriers are still electrons, but like I said before, we get the appearance of hole movement as electrons jump from hole to hole through the material. Holes flow from the now more positive emitter toward the more negative collector. Like I said, it's kind of an upside down operation. But how do these things work? Well, to answer this question, I'm going to focus my thoughts on the NPN transistor. From a very basic view of things, I'm going to picture myself as a lowly electron seeking to go somewhere. I am at the emitter. As I look up through the n-type material, I can see the p-n junction. And I know that this is the demilitarized zone and neither electrons nor holes are allowed to enter this. In fact, there's an electric field there that won't let anyone pass. So with nowhere to go, I just hang out here at the emitter. 
Now, someone is applying a positive voltage to the base terminal. In semiconductor speak, they are injecting holes into the base. These holes flow across the base emitter PN junction into the emitter. Yeah, yeah, I know. Holes don't actually move, but go with it here. The holes flow across the base emitter PN junction and into the emitter. That demilitarized zone is getting narrower and narrower and narrower, and more and more electrons are being allowed to pass. As the base current increases, injecting more and more holes into the base material, and more and more electrons are being allowed to pass through the base emitter PN junction. Some of the electrons that get past the base emitter junction get captured by the holes being injected into the base. But the vast majority of the electrons get to travel on to the collector through the base collector PN junction. This onslaught of electrons diffuses across the base collector space charge region. The electric field that exists there sweeps these electrons into the collector and away we go. I've made it to the collector and onto the circuitry that is beyond. The process is exactly the same for the PNP transistor, only, well, upside down. You might think that there has to be some way to mathematically express all of this. And there is but it can get really, really complicated well beyond what I'm going to present here. But with that said, here is a basic equation for you that I gleaned from my electrical engineering textbook. It says that the collector current is equal to I sub S times E brought to the quantity VBE over VT, where I sub S is what they call the saturation current. And this is a function of the electrical characteristics of the base emitter junction. VBE is the voltage across the base emitter junction. And VT is called the thermal voltage, which is 26 millivolts at 25 degrees Celsius or room temperature. So I got curious. So I plotted this using Excel, choosing a value for the saturation current IS that brought my values into the realm of reality. This turned out to be 6.679 picoamps. I used my little transistor curve tracer to measure a real transistor and exported the data to the same spreadsheet. Laying these plots side by side, I was amazed at how well the real transistor plot agreed with the theoretical calculated plot, as you can see here. Of course, this doesn't tell the whole story, but it certainly was a fun experiment. Well, now that we have an idea of how they work, the next question is, what metrics do they use to define their operation for us? That is the subject of the next video. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.